Good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome. I'm going to ask that if you're not on camera, please do come on camera. We'd love to see you. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the class of 2028. Congratulations. 2021 is the 48th anniversary of the Sophie Davis CUNY School of Medicine. You are the 49th class that will enroll. Over 2,600 students have graduating, graduated, upholding our mission of access, excellence, community. In 2028, you will be among over 3,600 plus Sophie Davis CUNY School of Medicine graduates. Your accomplished young men, young women recruited by ultra selective institutions and their honors programs. But of course you realize CUNY School of Medicine is the track best traveled to becoming a doctor and provides the most traction for your medical school success. On behalf of the Sophie Davis Office of Admissions, the Admissions Committee, Sophie Davis students, deans, faculty, administrative professionals, and the entire City College community, welcome to the Sophie Davis CUNY School of Medicine family. We applaud your many extraordinary achievements and some words of encouragement and wisdom I wish to impart. One of the byproducts of being a perfectionist and constantly trying to improve myself after somber feelings of low grade anxiety and a nagging sense of inadequacy, this anxiety keeps me humble. Dr. Anthony Fauci. Your very existence is wrapped up in the things you need to fulfill. Whatever you choose for a career path, remember the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. The late Chadwick Boseman. As for those selective institutions in pursuit of you, remember CUNY School of Medicine is a finer match because statistically, the very likelihood of becoming a physician is now exponentially greater. Your bachelor's degree is earned in three years, saving time and money. You are sure transition into medical school upon successful completion of your undergraduate studies at Sophie Davis. The MCAT examination or the medical college admission test is not a requirement, and you will be a member of a richly diverse extended family of like-minded physicians. Parents, grandparents, siblings, aunts, uncles, family members, extended family members, and of course, friends, I want to congratulate all of you as well. We all acknowledge and understand that it takes a village when it comes to raising children and helping them find their way. So many people play a vital role in making sure that that happens. And it's all of you, I'm sure. So take a moment, uh, relish it. I congratulate you on the fine work that you all have done as a collective community like the community that they will move into, the family structure in Sophie Davis, and we will continue to nurture your sons and daughters. And thank you for sharing them with us for the years ahead. I also would like to take a minute to acknowledge, and I will read off the names of all the admissions committee members, many of whom are here. Um, Dr. Janine Ajo, Dr. Lisa Arbach, Dr. Paul Gottlieb, Dr. Lynn Hernandez, Dr. Erica LeBeckin, Dr. D Dr. or Dean Danny Macbeth, Dr. Jody Meyer, Dr. Anna Mata Moss, Dr. Zhao Nunez, Ms. Leonie Peel, Ms. Joy Richards, Dr. Nicole Roberts, Dr. Calera Salas, Salas Ramirez, Dr. Maxine Wigway, yours truly, and of course, all the faculty and administrative professionals that assisted with the interview season at Sophie Davis. Uh, I also want to take the opportunity, of course, to thank the Sophie Davis Office of Admissions and all the administrative professionals that assisted with this. And that, of course, includes in no specific order, uh, Jody Meyer, Leonie Peel, Janice Pasifici Alhalde, Julia Makano, Bushva Benchrifa, and of course, our dedicated team of student ambassadors. Dr. Erica Friedman is a graduate of Penn State University. She graduated an accelerated BSMD degree program at Thomas Jefferson University Medical School in Philadelphia. 
She's interim dean, medical professor, and chair of the Department of Medical Education and Office of Academic Affairs. Uh, welcome, Dean Erica Friedman. Thank you, Mr. Erves. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to welcome you virtually to the City College of New York, home of the Sophie Davis Program and the CUNY School of Medicine. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to attend our virtual open house. The pandemic has disrupted almost all aspects of our lives and changed our priorities. I know how difficult it is for many of us to make decisions about the future when there are so many other immediate obstacles to surmount. However, it is so important to create some normalcy in our lives, to hope and plan for the future and continue to move forward despite the uncertainty. I also wanna reinforce how the mission of the Sophie Davis Program and the CUNY School of Medicine, now more than ever, is critical to of our nation. This devastating has exposed the inequities in our healthcare system and the disparities in outcomes for those who have no safety net, are poor, working frontline jobs with inadequate resources, inability to socially distance, or with little or no access to healthcare. This must be the catalyst for making the required changes in our healthcare system to provide access to quality medical services for everyone and to improve the social, political, and economic structures that shape our lives. This afternoon, you will learn about our school and our dedicated faculty and hear from some of our remarkable students who will provide you with information about our unique and very special BSMD program and what sets us apart from other medical schools. But first, I also wanna recognize our admissions committee who did another outstanding job in choosing all of you. You are a very special group. Our acceptance rate is among the most selective in the country. And this year was about 10% of those who applied. The CUNY School of Medicine builds upon the 48 year success of the Sophie Davis Biomedical Education Program. After receiving approval by the state to grant the MD degree, and accreditation by the Liaison Committee for Medical Education, we're excited that we are now able to educate and train our medical students for the entire BS and MD seven-year curriculum and to watch them grow into compassionate and caring physicians, advocates, and leaders. We're graduating our second class of physicians from the CUNY School of Medicine next month. I know that some of you have yet to decide on whether our school is the right one for you. What I'd like to share is that you will never find a more dedicated and passionate group of faculty, staff, and students. We are all here because we believe in the mission of the school and are committed to graduating the most highly trained and caring physicians who will change the future of healthcare for all. So what do combined programs offer? You have a clear route to residency and practice avoiding the stress of spending the majority of your time in college, focusing on getting into medical school and studying and taking the MCATs. You avoid the anxiety, uncertainty, and cost of applying, interviewing, and the potential rejection for medical school. And if you know what you wanna do, why not just do it? So what does the CUNY School of Medicine offer you? While your BS is completed in three years and the MD portion in the next four, our medical school curriculum is completely integrated across all seven years of the program. Our curriculum is centered on three themes. One, mentorship and self-directed learning to foster professional identity formation and lifelong learning. Two, providing a clinical context for every medical school course. And three, reducing the systemic causes of health inequities by focusing on the social determinants and environmental factors that impact on health. What is unique about your experience here? As a medical school, we use evidence-based educational practices for teaching and assessment and bring the resources and structure of a medical school to your undergraduate education and experiences. We have teachers and advisors, mentors and role models who are accomplished physicians, scientists and educators 
available to you from day one of your undergraduate education. We were able to immediately and relatively seamlessly pivot to virtual education because of the resources, infrastructure, and policies required of medical schools. Students begin their clinical training in the second year of the undergraduate curriculum, and in the undergraduate year three are assigned to an outpatient community clinic for a three-year continuity experience. We have an extensive population health curriculum to prepare students to practice medicine in the 21st century and to focus not only on the health of their individual patients, but also on the health of communities and the entire population. Our Department of Community Health and Social Medicine helped found the school and is the bedrock of what makes our school unique. Over seven years, students have developed close and meaningful relationships with their peers, faculty and staff nurturing their personal and professional development. In collaboration with Dean Hernandez, our Dean for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and our Inclusive Excellence Council, we work to ensure an inclusive and supportive learning environment. We are extremely fortunate to have strong and committed hospital partners, which include St. Barnabas Hospital Health System in the Bronx, Staten Island University Hospital, Harlem Hospital, Jacoby and North Central Bronx Hospital System and Forest Hills Hospital. They share our mission of serving the vulnerable populations living in their communities and ensuring everyone has access to quality health care. Together, we're working actively towards minimizing health care disparities right here in New York. Today, you will also learn more about our extensive support system that includes academic support, personal and career advising, mentoring, and support for your psychological and social well-being. We understand that it's a big transition for high school students to enter college, let alone a medical school. We will provide you with the necessary tools to successfully navigate your way through a rigorous curriculum, through your transition into the hospital environment, and prepare you to successfully secure competitive residencies to complete your medical training. We have built our reputation over the, fast, the past 40 plus years of our graduates having a high success rate in obtaining competitive residencies, both in primary care and in non-primary care specialties. Our graduates have been selected by outstanding residency programs, including NYU, Mount Sinai, Weill Cornell, Columbia Presbyterian, Montefiore, Northwell and its affiliates, Brown, Boston University, and Emory to name a few. David Brooks wrote an op-ed last year for the New York Times entitled, The Age of Coddling is Over. He spoke about medical school training being hard, that about 60% of pre-meds don't make it through their major, and how medical school trains people to work at a very high level and incredible stress so that they can manage in situations like our current pandemic. He eloquently stated, the virus is another reminder that hardship is woven into the warp and woof of existence. He quoted one of our Sophie Davis grads, Dr. Adina Callett, who worked at NYU for many years and is currently the director of the current Institute for Transformation of Medical Education at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Dr. Callett said, doctors are taught to run into the fire and not away from it. Doctors say, I'm terrified, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's courage. We're staying, we're a team. David Brooks ends by saying, excellence is not an action, it's a habit. It's doing what you were trained to do. It manifests not in those whose training spared them hardship, but in those whose training embraced hardship and taught students to deal with it. Our school trains you for excellence and prepares you to run into that fire. Our school isn't for everyone. We want students who care about social justice and equality. Our education program is intentionally structured to graduate compassionate physicians who have a commitment to improve the quality of life, education and health of not just their patients, but of their communities and the country. We spend the majority of our time together we expect everyone to demonstrate respect for each other, to work together as members of a team, 
to be open to the perspectives of others, and to contribute to making our community inclusive. We all choose to be here because we want to increase the diversity of the healthcare profession and improve the quality of care for the underserved. If these are your values and your calling, then this is the school for you. We expect to welcome you in person into our Sophie Davis family as our new first year class in August. While we hope and anticipate that we can have live fall semester classes, we're prepared to continue with online classes. Our coursework includes small groups and active learning, and we've been successful at using these teaching formats online. We will make sure that the start of college will be as seamless as possible and close to the experience that you're hoping for as we continue to get through this pandemic together. Decisions are the hardest things to make especially when it's a choice between where you should be and where you want to be. We selected you because we know the CUNY School of Medicine is where you should be. We hope it's ultimately where you want to be. I look forward to the opportunity to get to know you and help you become part of this noble profession, the CUNY School of Medicine family, and the future physicians that our country needs. I wish you all remain safe and healthy and continue to maintain hope throughout the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Friedman. Kyla Heidman is a talented graduate of Brooklyn College Academy, earned an impressive 37 college credits. It's a testament to her commitment to education and excellence. High school honors and awards are a portrait of achievement and consistency. At Brooklyn College Academy, she was selected to the gold honor roll her freshman year. Sophomore year, she was awarded for the highest geometry average and named to the Junior National Honor Society. 11th grade, she had the highest average in biology and named to the National Honor Society. In each of her first three years of high school, she was awarded for being the hardest worker and for having the highest average in physical education. These achievements reflect Kyler's impressive ability to challenge herself. She's a certified lifeguard and a swim instructor, teaching children and adults foundational techniques for swimming. Kyler is equally proactive as a blossoming healthcare professional and was an intern in the National Honors Careers Opportunity Program. There she served as a, there she served a diverse population in Brooklyn in that community and shadowed medical professionals. She loves her community and serves helping to organize fundraisers for breast cancer, clothing drives, toy collection for children and serving food to families experiencing economic hardships. She is dynamic, compassionate. She's an athletic gym and a fine example of why our future is filled with promise. Kyla, welcome. Thank you. Greetings, deans, faculty, staff members, and fellow students. Welcome to the Sophie Davis slash CUNY School of Medicine Class of 2028. And congratulations, incoming Class of 2028, on the beginning of your incredible journey in Sophie Davis. Now that your chapter of high school has ended, it is time to look forward to the prospects of your future as part of this unique program. I know the excitement you're feeling because last year I was in the same position. I always knew I wanted to attend Sophie Davis CUNY School of Medicine because their mission statement champions serving the underserved. These underserved populations historically lacked representation in healthcare, and I come from a community in which the healthcare system has failed. My motivation to attend the Sophie Davis slash SOM was reinforced through various settings even before I was accepted. Within my first year of attending Sophie Davis, I took courses such as narrative medicine and introduction to population health, which set guidelines for the role of physicians. Narrative medicine taught me to not underestimate the power of listening as it can transform how the physician cares for the patient with its overall patient focus. Introduction to population health encouraged me even more as I learned why healthcare reform is so necessary. I hope that you too can enjoy these classes and have even greater takeaways that propel you further into practicing medicine. Students, faculty members, and mentors are all options for support. 
Organizations that I have joined, such as Sisters of Sophie, a club for the empowerment of women pursuing medicine, the mentorship program, and the communication with the advisors and alumni via the professional foundations and new student, student seminar classes ensures that I have never felt alone. These options are more and, and more are available to you. You will make friends with your peers and others in the program. Even students who are in their last year of medical school, which is their seventh year in Sophie Davis, make themselves available to provide guidance and support. Through your time at Sophie Davis, you may become the guiding hand to an incoming U1 that is unsure and nervous about their next seven years. During my first year, even in a virtual setting, not only did I learn about science and medicine, but I also learned more about myself. I learned that imposter syndrome, which is a feeling of doubt in your achievements and capabilities to the point where you don't feel deserving of what you earned is a real phenomenon. While we may face challenges in our transitions from high school to college, and while we all have expectations of how we think we will perform, we may need to possibly evaluate and adjust as we grow and as we mature more each day. Through the challenges I faced, I persevered, improved my study habits, and set my mindset on a goal of continual improvement for growth. At some points in time during virtual learning, I lost some motivation and focus, and I started to feel burnt out and imposter syndrome. However, I was able to recenter my focus by highlighting the achievements I made, whether it was improving my grade in a class or understanding a concept that I struggled with and being able to teach it to a classmate, family member, or a friend outside of Sophie. With that being said, my advice to you is when you fall or hit a wall to pick yourself up, don't lose hope, stick with it, and celebrate all your victories, all your accomplishments, no matter how big or small. I advise you to form relationships with the Sophie Davis community, including with staff members, upper year students, and even your own classmates. By just reaching out to multiple people, you'll find that no two journeys in this program are alike, and therefore you should not feel inadequate or even the need to compare yourself to others. Again, I congratulate you on completing this milestone on finishing high school and gaining acceptance into the selective program that measures up to the standards you have placed on yourself and showcase during the admissions process. I'm excited to see each of your faces, whether it's through a computer screen or on campus during the 2021 to 2022 school year and all the years that follow. Thank you. Thank you, Kyla. Vanessa Devella. Arboleda is a third year student who you recall meeting during your interviews. She was elected by Sophie Davis peers to participate on the admissions committee. Vanessa is a leader and served well in her position. She's a graduate of White Plains High School and nurtured her love for medicine as a nurse aide at White Plains Hospital. There she provided care while patients were in the recovery room after the exited the recovery room. She prepared tea and assisted them with walking. Vanessa also served in the guidance office, assisting students applying to college and working with newly admitted bilingual students, helping them to transition to high school. She aided the White Plains School District through a technology summer support program and helped with computer connectivity of district computers to ensure student and staff had reliable access technology and medicine, a fine marriage. A mentor, a tutor, she has assisted elementary school students with reading, homework assignments, and engaged them in recreational activities. She's witty, engaging, and the definition of charisma. Welcome, Vanessa. Thank you, Mr. Erbs, for that introduction, and hello to everyone else. Uh, I hope you're all having a good time so far, especially our newly accepted students. It was so nice meeting and connecting with you guys during the interview process, and it is truly a pleasure to see you guys once again. A huge congratulations to all of you. You did it. I know you guys must be so happy and proud of yourselves for getting accepted to our wonderful BSMD seven year program. Okay, okay. I know exactly what some of you may be thinking right now. Seven years in the same place? I, I don't know. I mean, it kind of seems like a whole lot of time to be stuck someplace for me. But let me tell you, from my experience, time flies. I'm already a third year student about to be in medical school in the fall, and I really can't believe it. That's 
just how fast time has flown. It feels like just a couple weeks ago, I was in your shoes trying to decide where I wanted to attend college. Well, I guess it was more like I was debating on different schools until I received my Sophie acceptance. I mean, I've known I wanted to be a doctor since I was so young. So I knew being at Sophie was where I needed to be. From our mission to our community, being a Sophie means so much more than receiving a medical degree in seven years. I mean, that doesn't sound too bad though, though, does it? So being a Sophie means being part of the change. The change that recognizes the demand for more minority physicians to better serve our minority populations. While other colleges could help prepare me for the MCAT and whatever other tests I may need in order to become a doctor, I realized that Sophie would prepare me for so much more than just passing tests. Sophie has and still is preparing me to be a compassionate, a knowledgeable physician with a deep understanding of how social determinants affect the health of certain populations, while still passing my test, of course. Aside from the academic standpoint, the location of our program at CCNY leads to endless possibilities, ranging from on-campus activities to volunteer research opportunities to discovering the city with friends. Spoiler alert, being in an accelerated program doesn't stop you from having a life. You can still have a life and juggle your academics. Whether you wanna stay on campus or participate in club events or venture out and find your own opportunities, the choice is yours, which that's a plus for me. I like making choices myself. As a Sophie student, we are also part of the greater CCNY community and all that entails, including clubs and events. So if a Sophie, if there's not already a club at Sophie, you can venture out and make CCNY friends. Um, I know one of my favorite events is our CSOMS health fair on campus that includes free screenings, dental checkups, HIV testing, health coaching, and so much more. As a first year student, I actually learned how to take and read blood pressure, as well as calculate BMI and assist with free screenings offered to the community, which was so super exciting. Like I can't wait for us to get back on campus to do that. But um, aside from that, um, I wasn't really sure what else to talk about when I had this time with you guys, but I thought about what I would have probably liked to hear when I was in your shoes. So I thought some advice for your transition from high school to college wouldn't hurt anybody. So while college presents you with so many chances to get out there and be involved and away from your parents, it's up to you to manage your time. An obstacle in adjusting to this new environment is learning your time management so that you can not only succeed, but enjoy yourself at the same time. However, the, biz the biggest obstacle in my opinion is learning and knowing how to effectively study. In high school, I didn't study much. I was the type of student that would go over her notes maybe a day before the exam and get a good result. But you have to keep in mind that classes no longer meet every day of the week. So college is nowhere near the same as high school. Professors don't have time to continuously repeat information and remind you as teachers are able to do in, in high school. So it's up to you to keep reviewing for the most part. In learning to both manage your time and properly study, the transition into this new and exciting part of your life will be smooth sailing. Congratulations once again to you, this year's accepted students. I wish you all the best in your future endeavors and I look forward to seeing you on campus. Thank you, Vanessa. Clarence Kong is scheduled to graduate as a medical doctor next month and has matched to residency in emergency medicine at Northwell Health, North Shore, Long Island. He graduated Bronx High School of Science just seven years ago, and now he's heading to his first year of resident, residency. Time truly zooms. And during his years at Sophie Davis, he also moved quickly and progressively. Clarence's record of public service as an EMT, fire warden for City College, CPR, and first aid instructor all stem from his deep-rooted commitment to medicine. He still serves as an auxiliary police officer and vice commander for the US Coast Guard auxiliary team. These rich perspectives are reflected in his leadership. He's editor of a medical publication that provides references and learning objectives to assist medical students for national board examinations. His growing list of special certifications range New York State Department of Health COVID vaccinator, 
to Nassau County's Fire Academy hazardous materials operations and ICE rescue operations. He is equally committed to his professional memberships. They include National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians, American Medical Student Association, and Associated Board of Royal Music Schools. He's energetic, humorous, a mentor, tutor, and an excellent resource and supporter of students. Welcome, Clarence. Thank you so much for this kind introduction, Mr. Herbs. I am so excited to be able to be with you all today and to share my Sophie Davis experience. I have to agree with Vanessa and Mr. Herbs. Time absolutely flies. I remember that I was just in your shoes attending this accepted student's reception seven years ago. I remember enjoying an amazing lunch at City College with delicious fish and chicken. And I'm sorry that you all cannot experience that portion of the reception. I also remember that when the fourth year medical students spoke, I remember thinking how far off into the future that person is compared to me. And I cannot believe that I'm already here speaking with a group of some of the best and brightest high school grads. One of my favorite Sophie Davis memories is teaching CPR to the pipeline program, which is a program designed for high school students with an interest in the healthcare field. I had the honor of teaching CPR year after year in the program. And it was this experience that allowed me to realize that when you teach, you're learning for a second time. And this is one of the strengths of Sophie Davis. I love teaching and whatever it is that you are passionate about, whether it's teaching, research, academics, whatever it may be, the faculty here will make it their mission to help you develop your niche. I love teaching and I'm grateful that Sophie Davis was so conducive to helping me explore that passion. Another one of my favorite memories was captured during my medical school portion uh, of, of medical school during my family medicine rotation. I spent one week at a family shelter out in Long Island. And on my first day, I treated one of the middle, uh, one of the middle schoolers who stayed at the shelter with her mom. She would pass by the clinic with a big smile every day. And as I was walking out on the last day of my rotation, she ran after me to give me a hug. And I will always remember how beautiful the human aspect of medicine is from that encounter. Whatever route you choose to take, you will be a leader in that field. Take these seven years to do well in your identity as a student, but also set time to work on yourself as a leader and a human being. Learn about what drives you outside of medicine. Sharpen your interpersonal communication skills. Learn about emotional intelligence and situational awareness because who you are as a person is going to set you apart from others. You all have an exciting time ahead. Congratulations again on your acceptance. And I cannot wait to see what the future holds for all of you. Thank you, Clarence. Samuel Ayo graduated Sophie Davis in 2016. He earned his medical degree from Albany Medical College two years later. Currently, he's chief resident at Strong Memorial Hospital in Rochester, New York. I interviewed him 10 years ago on February 15th. There were two letters of recommendation that foretold his success in medical school and now as a resident. For his elementary school years, and I quote, Samuel has shown mastery and superior achievement in the sciences and math classes. He has consistently demonstrated an absolute determination and a focused work ethic, which places him among the top of his class. He's one of the most hardworking students I've ever encountered. Another recommender stated, in my 20 years of teaching, I have encountered and interacted with nearly 2,000 students. Rarely are they as memor memorable as Samuel Olakayode Ayo. Volunteering since age 14 at Mercy Hospital's emergency room, motivated by those experiences, 
and the struggle that individuals had in healthcare. Samuel moved forward in his career. He is an individual who's compassionate about his community. I recall a particular incident where I was on the road recruiting and met a, high, a professional working in the banking industry. Samuel had volunteered for a time in his younger years in the human resources department. She was a human resources professional. And she indicated to me that she knew him. Just by the name of Sophie Davis, she associated herself with Samuel Io. In another instance, I recall being at a family gathering where they were celebrating his graduation from Sophie Davis and then Albany Medical College. One of the things that was interesting is that there was a teacher, I believe middle school, who taught him science. They are celebrating. And it spoke to me of access, excellence, and community, and how he engaged the community that he grew up in. He was very active as a Colin Powell Fellow here at City College. He was engaged in the Black Male Initiative, which is a support, support group that encourages and retains young men of color who are interested in the Sophie Davis program, of course, of being a physician. He's a mentor and worked diligently with students. And now he works as a resident mentoring our students in the program. I want to welcome home Samuel Ayo. Wow. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Ms. Ernst, for that introduction. It also makes me feel old to have someone introducing me now. Um, first off, congratulations to the class of 2028, and welcome to Sophie Davis. Um, just two things on what Mr. Erz was saying. So I am an uh, internal medicine resident uh, at the University of Rochester, Strong Memorial Hospital in upstate New York. Um, and I was, accept I was offered and accepted a chief year, and I'll be doing that um, as an additional year at the end of my residency from 2022 uh, to 2023. So I'm not actively you know, uh, working in that role or capacity uh, right now, but we decided a bit earlier. Um, thank you again, Mr. Erbs. Uh, welcome again. This would uh, be the point where I would like, you know, the, the speaker would normally say, like, I remember where you were. I remember being in your shoes X amount of years ago. And I can't do that. Uh, I wasn't at my welcome uh, day at another engagement, but my family, my mother, my father, my sister were able to go. Um, and when they came back uh, and we all met up when I came back from my other event, they really just told me that the day reaffirmed everything that we had thought about the program when I decided to apply and reaffirmed the fact that I was, I was gonna go to Sophie Davis and um, live out this dream of uh, becoming a physician. So Mr. Irvs introduced me as Samuel and Samuel is my first name, but everyone, uh, most people call me Kaede. My patients call me Dr. Io now, which is still something I'm getting used to, second year of residency. Um, but friends and family call me Kay. Um, and by virtue of that, Sophie Davis um, calls me Kay because that is, you know, friends and family. And while I can't remember my acceptance students day or my welcome day, I can remember 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, which makes me sound old again, but 10 years ago, starting this journey, this journey to become a physician, and that's how I kind of looked at it uh, in the beginning. It's just a journey to become a physician. And like any great adventure, there were uh, highs and there were lows. And then there were really lows and there were successes and there were failures. Plot twists, redemption arcs, everything. Medical education has it all. So does medical training. There are a lot of times where you reach a point and you're told this is what you have to do and you think to yourself like oh my god how am i going to do it and each time you do it each time you'll rise to the occasion and the reality is through sophie davis um, into residency nothing ever gets easier 
you just continue to get better. And that's part of medicine and medicine training as well, that improvement. Sophie was unique in the way that it encouraged that improvement. It was unique in the way that it allowed for, for growth. And that's kind of going back to that comment I made about, I came in thinking I was just you know going to become a doctor, but I also really grew and you have to grow as a person. Now I'm gonna to speak to all of you as if you've already made the choice to join us and join this legacy um, as part of Sophie Davis. And I'll speak to you as such uh, moving forward. I am a fossil. I am a, a, a relic of the old model of Sophie Davis. Um, when I graduated in 2016, we still matched out to partner medical schools, hence why um, Mr. Erz mentioned Albany Med. You guys will all graduate from CUNY Med. Um, the second class is graduating this year and myself and my friends and many other people, because when you're part of Sophie, you're always kind of part of Sophie and you're always invested and you always keep track of things. And we looked at how last year's class, the first graduating class matched for residency and how this year's class matched for residency. And they, they matched really well to really impressive programs across a spectrum of specialties. So you guys should be reassured by that. Mr. Erz reached out to me about doing this uh, a couple of weeks ago and I had taken the time to kind of prepare, you know, more detailed remarks. Um, but after the events of Monday, um, I kind of spent some time trying to rework things to, to reflect the importance of what has been going on um, in the country. And I think it's important that it's acknowledged today at Acceptance Students Day. Uh, and it goes back again to that idea of not just becoming a physician. As part of your medical training, you will become a doctor. You will learn how to recognize signs and symptoms. You will learn how to prescribe medications. You will look for the right answer. And that's the easy part, honestly, of our jobs. The harder part is acknowledging the intangible aspect of our job, what I call the social capital of becoming a physician. As a doctor, and even as a medical student, when you have the opportunity to interact with patients, particularly in Sophie Davis, from the demographics, ethnically, racially, socioeconomically, you'll be serving underserved people. You'll be serving people who have a history of being disenfranchised by the very field that you're so excited to take this opportunity to become a part of. Sophie is unique in the way that it tries to teach you about these things and teach you about the role that you can have as a physician in addressing them, encouraging you to approach your patients from these backgrounds in unique ways that oftentimes, in many cases, only someone like you with your qualities, with your experiences, can meet them and can treat them. My training in Sophie Davis, my time in Sophie Davis has allowed me to become an incredibly well-rounded doctor. That's reflected in my selection as a chief resident, my academic ability. But I also know that part of that decision was the intangibles that I have, the ability that I have to connect with my patients, my team, my community. So to wrap up today, I'd like to congratulate you again. I'd like to welcome you again. And I'd like to encourage you to join us here at Sophie Davis. And I'd also like to encourage you to remember that when you start this journey here, you're learning to be a doctor but you're also learning to be a lot more. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Thank you, Dr. K. Danny Macbeth is Associate Dean for Student Affairs. He's a microbiologist and Associate Medical Professor in the Department of Microbiology Immunology. Dean Macbeth teaches fourth year students in the Sophie Davis program. He's earned his doctoral degree at the University of Colorado's Health Sciences Center and completed his postdoctoral studies at the University of Chicago. Uh, please welcome or welcome Dean Macbeth. Hi, everyone. Um, so every year, um, 
I get the opportunity to uh, have the distinct honor of speaking after um, all of the wonderful people you've just heard from. Um, to the students that spoke, you all did such an amazing job. Um, it, it's uh, really great now that we have seven years of students to sort of see the, the progression of students and, and what they choose to talk about um, from a first year to a third year to a seventh year. Um, but you all did a great job. And Dr. Io, it has been way too long. It was so nice to not only hear you, but to see you. So um, we'll have to catch up one of these days soon. Hopefully soon. Uh, David, go back. Good to see you as always as well. So. And then of course, the other reason that I'm last might be because I'm the least important. Um, and as far as Dr. Io's uh, comment about being a fossil, well, I actually am the fossil of the school because I've spent my entire career at uh, the Sophie Davis program and I couldn't be prouder of that. I have never ever wanted to go somewhere else. So um, I'm gonna be very short um, and so we can get to some questions and answers. I think some of the questions that have been submitted will be answered a little bit. Um, basically, I'm sort of given the job to summarize um, some of the things that uh, you've heard. So partly it'll be a little bit repetitive, but somewhat from my perspective. Um, I wanna start by saying thank you to the admissions office. Um, they have done an amazing job this year. Um, we talked a lot about what the admissions process would look like. How could we duplicate our normal process in a remote environment? And it all went off like a charm from uh, the waiting room that you all came into uh, prior to your interviews um, with the current students like Vanessa being there to greet you and talk to you to the breakout rooms to have the interviews. Everything worked so well. Um, what I'm going to turn to is just to talk about some of the topics that over the years um, it is clear are most concerned to students when they're trying to make this decision or even if you've already made the decision. So some of these have been mentioned briefly and I'll, I'll just mention them again. First are, you know, what are the advantages of coming to the CUNY School of Medicine, Sophie Davis Biomedical Education Program? Perhaps the biggest one in my mind is the small cohort. Um, you'll have many classes with the same group of 75-ish students. Um, and within that, you gain a real sense of community. You have smart, talented colleagues that have the same focus as you. I know for a fact that the friendships that you will make during your time in this program will last a lifetime. Um, I've seen it over and over and over again. Um, another advantage is the specific focus. As Dean Friedman talked about a fully integrated seven year program with a lot of your medical education occurring during your undergraduate years. Some people have talked about the uh, community health and social medicine coursework, most of which occurs in your undergraduate years. Um, you would not find that at any other combined program. We fully integrate your education from the undergraduate year one through the medical school year four. Um, and by having that specific focus, um, I assume that also the mission of the school is the reason that some of you chose to come here. And every speaker you've heard among the students as well as Dr. Io have made it very clear how important that is to us and to you, or you would not be here, I would assume. Um, other advantages, there are a lot of supports in a small program that you won't get in a very large program. There are academic supports in the form of um, a responsive and interested faculty. Uh, we have a very well-functioning learning resource center where students can get advisement about uh, study strategies, about how to manage time, but also uh, tutoring in literally any subject for which it is requested. We have student advisement. Each student is assigned an advisor at entry to the program. Um, there are also four medical, well, three medical student advisors, soon to be four um, in student affairs. Um, one of those medical student advisors focuses solely on undergraduates. Um, there's personal advisement through my office. Um, 
And let's see what else. There is, is the counseling center. Students have available to them should they need it, psychological counseling um, that uh, does not cost and can uh, occur for as long as is needed. Um, that is something else that you won't find a lot of places. And then of course you have your own classmates um, as a source of support. And as I said, you will make friendships that will last a lifetime and you will support one another through this amazing journey. Um, Amazing hard journey to su suggest it's easy would not be accurate, but people support one another and everybody gets through. Um, you have a lot of rich choices in extracurricular activities. So that was talked about a little bit by, I think, Vanessa um, and, and Kayla as well, I think. Um, so there are a lot of Sophie Davis specific clubs. Um, every medical student organization that you would find at any other medical school um, exists in our school, like the American Medical Student Association, Student National Medical Association, American Medical Women's Association, uh, Chapter of Physician for Human Rights, and many others. Um, over the past uh, couple of years, three years, four years, we've developed um, a series of special interest groups, which is something you also would find at any medical school. Um, the difference here is our undergraduate program, uh, undergraduate students can also participate in the special interest groups. These are built around particular specialty interests like a uh, special interest group in pediatrics or in internal medicine and in surgery or a variety of specialties. We have around 20 of them, I think at last count. Um, and then you also will be on the City College campus where there are more than 150 clubs. And our students very often will also participate in the larger City College community. And, and we encourage that, obviously. And then I wanna talk just very briefly about costs. Um, you will compare this uh, to the other offers you're being given. Um, even with some scholarship, acceptance to many private colleges will end up costing you more. Um, I wish we had more scholarships to offer. That is one of the questions. Um, we are, have an active Office of Institutional Advancement that is working on that. We don't currently have a lot of scholarship for entering students. We will have a uh, talk later about uh, financial aid and a lot of our students qualify for a lot of financial aid. And I'll get to some other possibilities here in a minute. Um, and then there's, of course, the savings by completing uh, the bachelor's degree in three years um, rather than four um, and doing that at uh, the City College of New York prices, which is also a lot less than you might find at certain other colleges. Um, medical school tuition and fees and estimated total expense can be found on the medical school website. Um, it's daunting. There's no question about it. Um, I will tell you that we have, uh, when you enter the medical school, a very uh, efficient and professional um, Office of Financial Aid that will work you through that. A lot of students, like every other medical school in the country, do take out loans for their medical school education. Um, but by having our own Office of Financial Aid for the medical school, that process is very simple and, and seamless. Um, we do have some programs that will help a little bit with financing later. Um, we have uh, Leonard Davis fellowships, both community service as well as community-based research. Um, those begin to be available um, following your first year. We have research fellowships called the Rudin Research Fellowships. Um, the final uh, endowment to the school from Sophie and Leonard Davis created the Sophie and Leonard Davis Scholarships, which are awarded to 10 students for um, each of the four years of medical school. Um, that's $7,500 when, um, when awarded in the first year. Um, we do have uh, primary care commitment scholarships for uh, the, the four years of medical school, which pay half tuition, but in exchange, students uh, sign a service commitment, uh, very similar to the service commitment that was in effect um, in the previous iteration of the program where students um, agree to practice primary care medicine in physician shortage areas um, in exchange for a half tuition scholarship. Um, and then there are also some scholarships and fellowships offered through the college. Um, you can look on the City College website um, in the search 
bar at the top, type in scholarships and, and you'll see the, there's a general scholarship application and then you can uh, select specific ones, a lot of alumni scholarships. Um, there are a lot of fellowships through the Colin Powell uh, Center on campus. Our students very often get those uh, fellowships and then some science research fellowships offered through the college, as well as in a partnership with Memorial Sloan Kettering that a lot of our students um, also are able to get after their first year. Um, and as I said, we're always seeking other ways to uh, support our students financially. Another question that is always comes up is study abroad. A lot of uh, students graduating from high school want to make sure they have the option to study abroad as part of their college education. That's a little harder here um, because of the nature of our very prescribed curriculum. So there are some ways it can be done. Um, one is in the summer following the first undergraduate year, you have a full summer during that year and some students use part of that summer to do a study abroad experience. Um, you can take an academic leave for a year um, and your place would be held for when you come back. And we've had students do that. Um, there are very short um, study abroad experiences through, uh, um, through the uh, appropriate city college office um, that occur in the intercession, which is basically the month of January. Again, that's only available in uh, the undergraduate year one because our students begin attending classes um, in very early January after year one through the rest of the program. And then we have a fellowship program called the Mac Lipkin Broader Horizons Fellowship, which funds about eight to 10 students per year from the U3 and M1 years to travel literally anywhere in the world for a six to eight week uh, summer research experience. We were not able to do that last year. We're also not able to do that this year, which uh, pains us, um, but that's the, the world we're in right now. Hopefully by next summer, things will be much better. So I think um, that's all I'm going to say other than to say congratulations again and welcome to our family. Um, I think that we're gonna move on to the question and answer session. And I was given a very long list of questions. So that way I'll uh, um, deal with, I mean, you're gonna hear from me again and I'll, and I'll go through my, my long list with some very short answers. Um, so I think that, sends me back to Mr. Herbs. Thank you, Dean Macbeth. It, it does send you uh, right back to me, thank you. Uh, we're gonna transition into our question and answer session for the program and the order in which we conduct this is going to be a little different than the program that you have in front of you, but it will be basic to follow. Uh, what we're going to start with are some formal presentations and then we'll move into specific question and answer sessions. So, Next up is Kamal Sadiq, who's a financial aid specialist for the City College of New York, here to address some of your questions about financial aid as it relates to Sophie Davis. Hello, everyone. My name is Kamal uh, Sadiq, and I'm one of the financial aid counselors. Uh, so today I will be just walking you through the financial aid uh, process. So we're going to be, I'm just going to use the PowerPoint. So the first one is navigating the financial aid at CCNY. So the topics we'll be covering today is the financial and stated application, uh, federal eligibility, types of financial aid, credit requirements, outstanding items to do, secure portal submission of documents, type of state aid, uh, doing, uh, pending aid and bill. Wow. All right, thank you. Requesting direct loan form, interest rates of direct loans, plus loans, alternative loans, and the financial aid information. All right, so today I will be also telling you, I think most of you have already, I'm sorry, most of you have already filed your uh, federal and state aid application. So the first one is you have to complete your federal aid application, which for the 2020 to 2021, uh, 2021 to 2022 back semi here. So for the 2021 to 2022 FAFSA application, you will you can complete the application as of early as October 1st every year. The school code for City College is 002688. And then for uh, for this application, we use the prior prior income information 
as of right now for 2021 to 2022, we'll be using the 2019 tax information, W-2s, and other income for 2019. For the New York State application, the school code for city college is 1411-1411. TAP application, you can complete it on this HES website. And for the TAP application, you must be a New York State resident and you can use your 2019 income information. And after you complete the TAP application, mostly, uh, usually most of the students get a link letting them know, hey, you can complete your TAP application using this link. So they transfer information from the federal uh, to state. Some of it, if you don't get the link, you can just use this link, has link and complete the TAP application. Undocumented students, they can apply for state aid on the HES website. All right, so federal eligibility. So you must have a high school diploma or GED. Uh, you must be enrolled into a degree program. You must be a US citizen, eligible not citizen. You must meet the academic, satisfactory academic progress, which is set by school, college. Uh, you should not be in any kind of default or owe money to federal student grants. And then if you are a male, ages between the age of 18 to 26, you must register for selective service and demonstrate financial aid need. All right, so type of financial aid you get, uh, you can receive is the first one is Pell Grant. Uh, Pell Grant, you can receive it as a part-time student or as a full-time student, but it's a need based. And for the Pell Grant for the 2021 to 2022, it, the award is going to range from $330 to $6,400 $95 academic year. SEOG, uh, you can also get that, which is a supplemental educational opportunity grant, which is need-based and per semester you get up, uh, up to like $200. Federal grant, which is also, excuse me, federal work study, which is also a need-based. Um, then you can apply for federal loans. Uh, you must be taking at least six or more credits in order for you to be eligible. The federal loans there are three kind. The first one is federal direct subsidized loan, uh, federal indirect Stafford loans, and the federal, excuse me, direct plus loan for parents, for parents, which is a credit base. And the subsidized loan is a uh, need base. All right, so the credit requirements for Pell, uh, Pell requires you can take from one credit to 12 credits. Um, Pell, it's limited, uh, it's limited to 12 uh, full-time semesters and which is 600% eligibility. And one full semester is 50%. Uh, for New York State, um, you must be taking at least 12 credits towards, the, towards your program of studies, and which is limited the tab, you get it up to eight semester, unless you're in some kind of special program that you seek. Excelsior, Excelsior scholarship, you get for 30, uh, you must be taking at least 30 credits, and you have to take those 30 credits within the 365 days from the start date. Uh, you can also get part-time TAP, which is APTS, uh, which requires um, you must take three to learn credits in order for you to be eligible. And for that, you must be completing the supplement form, which is which I'm going to show you in the next slide. Uh, uh, that it should be completed the first week of the semester, or excuse me, the first three weeks of the semester. And the alternative loans, you also have that option. Minimum is for alternative loans, the requirement is six credits. But it also depends from it also depends on the lender and and they have the different interest rates. All right, so that's uh, so how you can see that if you have any kind of outstanding uh, items on your account on uh, if I if we request anything like if you're selected for verification, if you give need to give us um, immigration status proof or verification documents or anything, if you're selected for verification, it is already on your to-do list on your TD First account. So make sure, please, if you have already completed the FAFSA and you, you have the CCNY code, which is for federal is 00268A and state is 1411, make sure you check your to-do list. If you have any documents, outstanding documents, make sure you submit the documents to us. I'm gonna tell you how. In order for us, to receive any kind of documents from you guys, you need to use the secure portal, which is, it's already on our CCNY website. You can go to the CCNY website, uh, just search for financial aid on the very first link, you click on it and it will, on the very first page, it shows you uh, to send any, if you have to send any documents, you click on the website and it will take you to the secure portal. Make sure you use your CCNY ID and then uh, 
uh, sub chat, you could just tell us whatever you're sending us, your CUNY ID and first name, last name, and we just attach all the documents. All right, so type of uh, New York state aid. A state aid, you can apply, as I said before, you can apply it on the HESC website. And if you need any additional documents, it's also, excuse me, additional information, it's already on the HESC website. Uh, New York State Aid, which is TAP. Currently, the award ranges from $500 to $5,165 academic year full time. Excelsior, the current maximum Excelsior scholarship award is $2,750 per semester, or the actual tuition cost, whichever is less. The scholarship will be reduced by other financial aid awards because Excelsior is the lost dollar amount. If you're getting TAP and Pell, if you're not covered fully and Excelsior eligible, the Excelsior will come in and cover the difference. Um, uh, which is, oh, the last one is aid for part-time studies. As we, as I mentioned before, um, you must take at least three through 11 credits in order for you to be eligible. And the award maximum, the maximum award is $2,000 per semester, uh, excuse me, per year. And the APTS award cannot exceed tuition charges. You can complete the, supplement form on your CUNY First account. So if you go to your CUNY First account on the left-hand side, um, you'll be able to see this form, supplement form, and make sure you must be a New York resident. For Jose Peralta Dream Act, you can apply it on directly on their website. All right, so how you can see that if you have any pending financial aid on your account. So the first step is you log into your CUNY First account using your credentials. Second is you go to Campus Solution from the left menu. And then the third one is you click on student center tab. The fourth one is you scroll down and on the left hand side it says view financially. Then you click on it, then you choose the school. There might be other schools, you just choose city college and eight year for 2021 to 2022. So that will be 2022. And then you can see um, how the financial aid looks like. That's how the fin view financial aid is going to look like. If you have any, like if you're getting tap, Pell, or anything, that's how it's going to look like. All right. So direct loans, the city college of, for the city college of New York, the CCNY does not auto package direct loans for the undergraduate student. So you must apply for loans. So how you can apply for loans? This is your CUNY First account on the left hand side. I'm showing. You go to CUNY First account. Right on the left hand side, you click on direct loan processing form. As you click on it, it will have another tab. It will, you just have to put the institution and uh, the aid year, and it will open a loan application for you. Right now, you might not have the loan application right now because uh, I think the loan application is opening somewhere at end of May or June. Um, but if you have any questions, you can always contact our office and we'll provide you more information. And as long as uh, when the loan application opens, um, you can apply for the summer, fall, and spring for the whole academic year. And so you don't have to keep going back and applying for the loans for each academic year. Uh, and then you can borrow up to your grade level and the cost of attendance, which you can click on this link or go to the CCNY financial aid website. You'll be able to see how much loan you can apply for, or you can always contact our office and someone should be able to assist you. All right, so type of financial aid in the to loans, federal loans, volume default loans, as of 2020 to 2021, the interest rate is, or as an undergrad student, is 2.75%. Um, for the student must complete, uh, you can go to, after completing the loan application, then you can go to the student loan scout website. You can complete the master promissory note for the subsidized and unsubsidized. And master promissory note is you're promising the fact that you'll pay back your loan. And the entrance counseling on the same website, which is also letting, just telling you the difference between what your responsibility is and what are you putting yourself into. And the second one is federal uh, pound plus, uh, which is uh, the interest rate is 5.30% as of 2020 to 2021. As the parents will be completing the pound plus loan application, which we'll have it on our website. And right now it's not available, but we'll have it. And then the parents will be completing the master promissory you know, it's same as they're promising the fact that they'll pay back their loans and then they'll complete the entrance counseling. As of uh, I, uh, July 1st, I think the um, interest rate might change. So for alternative loans, uh, you can apply through the bank or the, uh, that's a private lender. So the interest rate varies. 
So private education loans are based on credit. Student, you would have to do your own research if you want to apply for the alternative loan. All right, so this is our contact information. If you have any kind of questions, you can contact our, uh, we have the phone number right here. The virtual counter is the best way you click on the meeting number, which is also on our website. And then you will be able to speak to me or any other counselor and somebody should be able to assist you. And then most of the information you'll be able to find it on our website. Thank you. Mr. Deek, thank you very much. Uh, Michelle Bolton is the Director of Financial Aid for the CUNY School of Medicine, and she has an overview regarding financial aid on the medical school side. Good afternoon and welcome. Again, my name is Michelle Bolton. I'm the Director for the Office of Financial Aid for the School of Medicine. Our department services the PA graduate professionals along with the medical students within the Sophie Davis program, which means I won't have the privilege of working with you for another three years from the time you begin this distinguished program. The process in obtaining federal aid is the same as applying as an undergraduate student. Within the fall semester of your final year as an undergraduate student, you will start getting email notifications on how to complete the free application for student aid for the upcoming year as an independent medical student. I will keep on emailing you once a month until all students have completed the application. Within the spring semester before commencement, we will have a transition information session that will go over all the needs or things you need to know regarding the process for the four years of medical school and eligibility. Funds that you usually obtain during your undergraduate years, such as Pell, the Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant, and the state fund called the TAP grant are only offered to first bachelor degree recipients. Second degree bachelor recipients, graduate professional degree recipients are not considered eligible for these types of funds. Medical programs along with professional programs are initially offered federal aid in the form of loans. The loan amounts that are offered it's enough to cover tuition and fees along with living expenses such as rent, food, um, and any other expenditures. There are a few institutional scholarship opportunities that Dean McBeth um, spoke about earlier. One being the primary care scholarship, which is a commitment scholarship that covers up to 50% of tuition. We also have a Sophie Davis scholarship that's renewable in the amount of $10,000 per an academic year. And there are a few scholarships that you will obtain during your years at CCNY that are transferable for the first two years of medical school. By the time you enter the School of Medicine within a few years, we'll have additional opportunities for you. We look forward to working with you throughout your journey and your success. Thank you. Atia Patterson is an Assistant Director of Housing for the Towers and she comes forward now to give you some information about housing opportunities through the residence hall of the towers here on the City College campus. Hello everyone, as mentioned, my name is Atia and I'm the Assistant Director of Housing at the Towers. If you decided to reside in the towers, you'll be going through the process with me. I'm one of the responsible um, things that I have at the towers is the contracting part of it, also and dealing with the financing part of it as well for the towers. So I kind of, handle everything in terms of from the signing up to how to pay, all of that stuff. I'm that person <laughs> that you will need to contact. Um, the Towers is around seven to 10 minutes walk away from the main campus. Some students say it's five to seven, but I'm somebody that generally doesn't like to walk. So I'm saying it's around a 10 minute walk. Um, and one of the ways that you apply to the Towers is through our website, ccnytowers.com. We generally have students ask us, if we apply through the school, no, you, it's a completely separate process for housing. And so you'll have to go to our website, ccnytowers.com. Application and room assignments are based on a first come first serve basis. So the sooner you apply, the better. We actually started the process for the fall semester probably around two weeks ago. So we just started, we're getting a lot of applications in and we're starting to send out contracts for students to reserve their spaces for the fall semester. For this year, our moving date is actually scheduled for Saturday, August 21st. So that is the date that we have on schedule for the moving date. 
Next slide, thank you. So all of these are our amenities that's included. We have free laundry, fitness room, music room, community kitchen. We have actually eight lounges throughout the building. Um, we have in our community kitchen, we have three ovens, um, a stove and a microwave. And then we have a seminar room slash multi-purpose room. We call that a multi-purpose room because the RAs sometimes hold events in there. One of the events that I love that they generally do every year is called Midnight Breakfast, where we're serving our residents breakfast at midnight. And that's because they're up studying, it's finals, they're up studying late. And so we wanna make sure that they're being fueled and then we're giving them something to eat. And so that's an event that I, one of my personal favorites that we do at the Towers. And a lot of students use it for study. When we're not using it for program, it's always available for studying. And we also now have a smart board in there that students can use as a study group. Next slide, thank you. So we have four different room types. What we're showing you right now are the most common, the most popular is the two bedroom shared and the four bedroom private. The other one, we have one bedroom shared and a three bedroom private. Think of it as for the two bedroom shared, think of it like one of those sides is not a there. So that's what the one bedroom looks like. So if you're looking at the two bedroom shared, imagine half of that suite is not there. That's what the one bedroom shared would look like. And for the four bedroom, imagine one room is not on that suite. And that's what the three bedroom private looks like. So it's just one less person in those spaces. Um, sometimes they ask, do, can I have an entire suite for myself? The answer is no, unfortunately, we do have private suites, but that is for faculty and staff only. So the students will have an option to either have a room to themselves or their share room. The cost generally, or you can go back to the other side, the cost generally ranges um, from around 12,000 to 20,000 for the year, depends on the room type that you select and also depends on the term. So we do have two contract terms. One is an academic contract and that goes from August until May. And then we have another one that goes from August until July and that's the annual contracts. So those are the two contracts that we do offer. Um, students might ask, well, what can I do a semester? We only offer semester contracts if you're coming in in January, right? And, so, and that's because you're coming in halfway through the semester. And so if you're coming in in January, you'll then will decide to select a contract from January to May or January until July, but otherwise the contract starts in August and it goes until the next year. We do have some different payment options as well. Um, and there are three payment options that we have for students interested in housing. We have the option to use financial aid um, or installments or paying everything upfront for the semester. For students that wanna use financial aid, so what we call that is a deferred payment, right? So we're not expecting you for using financial aid to be able to pay everything upfront. What we do is that you just give us information that shows the amount of aid that you have coming in. And if you have enough to cover, we just wait until your aid comes in. So if you're coming in in August, if your aid is not gonna be dispersed until October, we wait until October for you to make a payment. So you won't have to worry about that at all. And the installment payment plan is the entire year cost. We just divide into 10 payments. And then the semester cost, that's due the beginning of each semester. So half of the contract term is due in August and the other half is due in um, January. And one more thing, all the suites come fully furnished. You're looking at a picture of an actual residence room that she decorated that herself. So you'll come in with a fully furnished, you'll have a bed. The bed um, is actually extra long twins. You will have a computer table and a dresser drawer. So all that is provided to you, um, but you'll have to come with your beddings and everything else, but that's an actual residence space. Next slide, please. Thank you. Benefits of living on campus, close to your classes. Um, that's one of the great things. You don't have to worry about commuting far. The time that sometimes you take commuting, um, just like myself, I, I commute into work. Happy I'm actually home now. But generally, commuting takes a lot of time, right? And especially in the Sophie Davis program, you want to have that time that you can have for studying versus spending that time to commute. So that's one of the benefits of being there. We have all the amenities included. So what you're paying covers everything. You have your free internet, free cable. Um, we do have phones, laundry. The only thing that you have to think about in terms of an additional cost is your food, right? And some residents, what the parents will do is that they'll come in, they'll bring 
food in containers. So sometimes they'll cook, they'll put some food in containers and the residents will put it in the refrigerator. And some students cook themselves and um, some students order, but majority of the students cook themselves or the parents are bringing things in for them. And it's a community feel. You know, the towers is a place that it's only students, faculty and staff that reside in the towers. So you're not gonna have anyone else from the outside that doesn't have the same mission as you within the towers. And we do have, generally every year, we do have a lot of Sophie Davis students as well at the Towers um, and that they kind of carry on. They have a lot of study groups. We've actually had RAs as well, which is residence assistants that have been our um, Sophie Davis students in the past. And we also have 24-hour courtesy officers. So regardless of, even if the office is closed, we have courtesy offices available, they're 24 seven. Um, even if the office is closed, we have RAs. They, we call them RAs, but they call resident assistants. And they're also available when the office is closed. So we close at five o'clock. Then the RAs are on call from five until the office opens again at 9 a.m. in the morning. And even on the weekends, when we close on the weekend, the RAs are always on call. And then that's just some, you know, something I mentioned before, the RAs and different programming events as well. And this is just some ways that you can connect with us. One thing that's not on here, we just started to do a little bit more with our YouTube channel um, since the pandemic. And so the RAs will be putting videos on their RAs sharing the experience, what it's been like in the towers. And so we also have these ways for you to connect with us as well as our YouTube channel. Yep, next slide, thank you. We're also conducting virtual tours. So um, you can go to our website, that's the link right there as well. You can go to our website, sign up for a virtual tour. You'll be able to speak to myself or another staff member so that you have questions that may be personalized to you that you may want to know about. Um, we'll definitely be happy to um, see you. We do have some evenings tours as well um, and weekends. So we're trying to make sure that we have time slots available for everyone to everyone's need as well. One of the questions that we have been asked into, um, in regards to the fall semester is what happens if the school doesn't open and they sign a contract, do you get a refund, right? So the way that we, it's worked right now is that in the contract, there's an addendum that states if the, in the event something happens before August 1st, that you'll be allowed to cancel your agreement um, if things are not back to semi-normal by that time. And so that's kind of what we have built in place for the contract. We do have a lot of students already applying, which is exciting for us because we miss, we miss our students. We do have students living in the towers right now, but it's not as many as at a normal school year. So we're definitely excited about that. Um, and, if, and I think that's it. If you have any questions, I'm definitely here to um, answer all the questions that you have. And I'm happy that you took this time to join us today. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. In order of the program going forward, we're going to spend a little more time answering some of your questions. Some of them are admissions related and I'm going to start answering those questions. Uh, we will have a panel that will also answer some of the questions that you had specific for them. Keep in mind that after our program concludes, there will be a session where our current students will meet the admitted students. We're gonna ask you to take a break, stay zoomed in, and that session will begin, but I will, allow, I will announce the time as we get closer to that. In answering your questions, basically, of course, classes start on the 25th of August. There's a mandatory orientation on the 24th. Uh, there was a question about courses that you take with CCNY students? The answer is yes. Um, you will take some courses with CCNY students generally during the first, second, third semesters. There was a question also about the transition, meaning when students do well in the program on, for the undergraduate years, do they transition into the medical school years? And if you perform well academically, uh, you will transition into the medical school years and there will be more details about that, particularly during orientation. If your high school's closed and you have difficulty securing documents you need like an official transcript, we'll work with that. We understand that there are some challenges for some high schools, although it's been our experience that the majority of them have been able to send transcripts. You will of course be required to send an official transcript with all of your final grades. The benefits package that you might have received if you were also admitted into Macaulay Honors 
uh, will not apply to Sophie Davis because they're separate programs. So if your financial aid package for Macaulay is covering all of your tuition, it may or may not for Sophie Davis. So you're going to have to file uh, FAFSA or go forward with speaking with financial aid to determine the steps you have to follow so that we now know you're transitioning into Sophie Davis because the Macaulay package uh, will not transfer into our program. Live campus tours, um, post pandemic, when we reopen, uh, there will be. Uh, tuition currently $3,465 per year. That's as of the spring semester. Out of state tuition currently $620 per credit. Students who receive scholarships that are external to what may be offered through Sophie Davis, those scholarships will be offered, uh, honored, I should say, by those institutions or companies or organizations that sponsor scholarships for students. So the short answer is, is yes. You will receive a letter um, in communication going forward about registration and orientation, expect that, not the letter, but the actual orientation and registration to take place about the second week of June, you will be notified of that. There will be other communications that you should watch for and carefully monitor your email for updates. Students have asked questions about IB or AP credit. Uh, generally, when it comes to AP credit four or five, you might receive credit as an exemption credit, or you might receive credit as an elective. Um, you will receive information online that will allow you to look at the possible credit that you will receive based on your AP grade. Uh, look for that information as well. There is a summer pre-matriculation program. It starts the 19th of July through the 30th of July. It is virtual. Uh, that information is in your packet. Uh, just be aware. So now, for questions. I believe that Dean Friedman had a set of questions that she wanted to answer for you. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Irves. Uh, so first, I want to let you know the good news, which was that the state determined recently with their budget that tuition will be frozen for the next three years. So there will be no tuition increase either in the undergraduate or the medical school for the next three years. Uh, in addition, there was a question about how many students remain in the program. So I want you to first understand that combined baccalaureate MD programs have a significant attrition rate, anywhere between 15 and 20 percent. When I was in my program, we actually lost a third of our students and only about 65 percent of them ended up with an MD. For our Sophie Davis undergraduate, about 85 to 90% of students remain in the program and go on into the medical school. And then for students who enroll in the medical school, about 96% of them graduate with an MD degree. Uh, the other questions I had related to campus reopening uh, required vaccinations, what we're doing to keep everyone safe. So I'll try to cover all of that. Um, for the fall, the city college campus will be open and we expect and hope for about 50% capacity for classes that are live. Understanding, however, that based upon the incidence of COVID positivity and the vaccine rate, things could change. Decisions about vaccination and testing are made by CUNY for all of its schools based upon recommendations from the state. You do not need to show proof of vaccination to register for classes. CUNY has not yet made a final decision about vaccine requirements because the current vaccines have only been approved for emergency use authorization. Two of them will likely be uh, fully authorized by the summer, and then CUNY may require vaccination except for those with exemptions, but currently they do not require vaccinations. Most of our year four through seven students have already been vaccinated in preparation for their clinical experiences. If things remain the same or improve, we plan a live two-day orientation before classes start. For the fall, most of your classes are city college courses and we don't have control over those. Only three of your required 17 credits are Sophie Davis taught, and it's a narrative medicine course with small groups and four different sections. Um, that class will be virtual, uh, 
Um, but a number of City College classes will be live. We have not heard yet about the, the, the classes you take, which are biology, physics, and world civilization, uh, to know yet, but we'll keep you posted. Um, in addition, um, the, the City College now has a vaccine center in large part due to us. Um, the campus has been open since March for essential administrators and research faculty. And then within the last couple of months, for those whose courses needed to be taught on campus, um, our reopening plans at City Colleges were created by a committee and approved by CUNY and have kept the campus safe. Anyone from our program who comes to the campus has to be approved by myself first and then the provost and is then put on a list kept by security. We have a software application that must be completed each day you come to campus, documenting your lack of symptoms or else you can't come. All people that come to campus are logged in and out so we can do contact tracing if someone reports symptoms. We do not require mandatory or random testing currently. All buildings have specific reopening plans. And with, it, with our administration, I created the reopening plans for our building, Harris Hall. And when we were inspected by CUNY, we were told our plans were superb. We have verified the ventilation in the building, changed all the air filters to be at least MERV 13, and have appropriate signage, restrictions on each office classroom, and provide appropriate PPE, requiring everyone is approved to enter the building before they come in. We also have adequate hand sanitizer, disinfect the spaces between usage and cleaning after each use. We have the building open now. It's been open for our physical diagnosis sessions, first for our second year medical students, currently for our first year students. Um, we also have had it open for the students who need a quiet place to take exams, or to study for required USMLE step one exams, which students take before entering their third year of medical school. We have some key staff and faculty currently in the building and have not had one instance of COVID infection. Currently, other campus facilities have been restricted, but we expect some to open up this fall. Uh, again, related to the vaccine center, we have a New York City Department of Health vaccine site at City College, in large part due to the School of Medicine. And we've had students who have been volunteering to man the site. Uh, we've also been recruiting the Harlem community to get vaccinated. We're now overseeing helping City College employees register to be vaccinated at that site, and we hope to do that for all of CUNY Health Science students eventually. I think that's it for my questions. Thank you, Dean Friedman. Um, Dr. Lisa Arbach is the Assistant Dean for Clinical Curriculum here at Sophie Davis. She has a presentation for you. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Congratulations. I recognize some of you. Um, for my work on the admissions committee interviewing you. So I'm thrilled to see, um, yeah, thanks. So this is just gonna be very brief. Um, I'm the assistant dean for the clinical curriculum. I'm a, a general internist by training. I did my training in the Bronx at Montefiore where now you'll see some of our students right near there in these pictures. So our reason that you apply to our school, the reason I think you wanna come to our school is to get in there and take care of patients as early as possible. So as we, as I describe a little bit about our experiences, you're gonna see that our students get to do that even as undergraduates. Next slide. So we have early exposure to um, actual patients and actual healthcare settings as early as the second year in the undergrad. So that's what we call U2 and U3. So we have a class in the summer right after the U2 year called Evaluation in Healthcare Settings, where students are placed in uh, either a health clinic or a social services clinic, and they work with the people who work in that um, clinic to design to deeply look into things in the clinic that could be improved. And they work to develop a research project around that so that they can help that clinic give the best care to the patients or customers who use that system. In the, I'm sorry, can, back to that same slide. We have starting in the U3 year, our practice of medicine, that's what we call POM. And these are the doctoring courses where you start to learn how to be a doctor as early as the third year undergrad. And in that class, both in POM 1, POM 2, 
in U2, U3, and then in um, the M1 and the M2 years, I'm sorry, it starts in U2, students learn to speak with patients. They get really um, familiar with how we communicate with patients, how we take a medical history, um, and they learn a, about wellness, what's important for them and patients to be healthy. And they begin their longitudinal clinical experience. So this is a really exciting experience for our students starting in that um, third year undergrad. They're assigned to a clinic, a federally qualified health center or lookalike and work with a, a doctor in that clinic seven or eight times during that year. And for the next two years, they'll go back to that same clinic and really work with that doctor to care for patients, learn about how the clinic works and learn how to care for patients. Next. When they move into the M1 and the M2 year, that's the fourth year, um, they begin physical diagnosis, learning to examine each other in person. These are sessions will be in person next year. So they examine each other, um, continue to work on communication skills, um, and then continue that longitudinal clinical experience. So going back to that same clinic they were introduced to in the undergrad. And we are so lucky now to have uh, an affiliation with Jacoby uh, Hospital in the Bronx where they have a simulation center. Students will get to go there, learn how to do stitches, put in IVs, all the kind of exciting procedures that students like to know how to do before they begin their clerkships in the M3 year. Next slide. In the M3 year, that's when students really feel like they're like the students on TV or the doctors on TV. These are three of our students at our new site, which is at Jacoby North Central Bronx. These are students who are about to be finishing their M3 year and applying for residency. Next, I think there's an animation here. So we have um, in the M3 year, our students do these cl this clinical work in pediatrics. Next, surgery, internal medicine, psychiatry and neurology. OBGYN and family medicine. So family, and many of these relate to our mission of primary care, family medicine, OBGYN and internal medicine. Pediatrics are all primary care specialties, but our students are exposed to all of these so they can choose what they wanna do. Students are allowed to choose any field that, that interests them. Next slide, I'm gonna show you where they do these sites. So these clinical sites now we have, I think uh, Dean Friedman already talked about most of them, but you can see here we have sites in the Bronx, in Staten Island, Harlem, um, Queens, um, and these Institute for Family Health are our family medicine sites. So most those are in the Bronx. Uh, we have family medicine sites on Long Island. So some of the students who live out on Long Island, Glen Cove, Southside and um, Phelps and Westchester, they sometimes live at home during those um, family medicine sites if they're near their families. Next. In our fourth year, our students are really almost doctors and the hospitals treat them as such. So when they do, you can see here emergency medicine or the sub-internship or a critical care rotation. Um, Clarence, who spoke earlier, has probably in some of these pictures, he helped me organize this special day here at the simulation center where they practice doing all kinds of really um, high doctor level procedures like uh, for students who these are using not real patients but they have pretend arrests and the students learned how to deal with that. In the sub-internship in the hospitals we have that in medicine, pediatrics and surgery the students work as interns with close supervision and then they um, have the opportunity to do multiple electives which can be within our system, within New York State, within the entire country and when the pandemic is over anywhere in the world. They can apply for uh, an elective outside of the country. We have a committee that oversees that, CCNY makes sure it's safe to go where they're going and then they can go. So we did have some students go to um, Colombia, I believe last year, Argentina. So um, our fourth year students are really ready to go when they go through their match day, which was last month. And then they are ready to, they know where they're going. They have this boot camp here where the pictures are that really gets them ready to be doctors so that on day one, July one, they are ready to go. I think that's it. Thank you, Dr. Arbach. We're going to invite uh, Dean Macbeth to return to answer a few more of your questions. Hi again, everybody. So uh, as I said earlier, I have a big long list but um, I think a lot of these have, have been answered, so I'm going to skip them. And I think at the end, um, uh, Mr. Ertz or Ms. Peel will give you some instruction about how to submit uh, questions if you feel that you've asked something that either wasn't fully answered or that you, um, or wasn't answered at all. Um, the first relates to housing. Uh, 
you just had a, a lot of information from Ms. Patterson in the towers, but this question was kind of how many students live in the towers. So the question is, do the majority of first year students dorm in the towers? The answer to that is uh, for the past uh, couple of years, maybe even three, it's a, about 50% of the entering class um, dorms in the towers. Um, the next one is what year would you recommend applying for housing um, and what is the cost? And um, that's really a very personal decision. We have students who, who come to live on uh, the campus, either in the towers or in apartments nearby. Um, from the very first year, we have students who move in uh, near the campus by their third year. Certainly by the time you are in the medical school years, we would, uh, we would encourage students to live near campus, although there are students that continue to commute from home throughout the entire seven years. So those are very personal decisions. Um, Mr. Erbs mentioned a little bit about the transfer of AP credits and other kinds of uh, transfer credits that you might have accumulated in high school. Um, I think he also talked about the fact that we'll have a new student orientation um, in early June, um, by the second week of June. And we'll go over a lot of this stuff then. And in the meantime, you'll get a lot of information from our Office of Academic Records about all of that once we have, um, uh, once we have the, the class finalized. So uh, the purpose of that orientation in June is to get you registered, um, talk about how you transfer credits. But if you're curious about what uh, your AP credits uh, would uh, allow for, you can go on the City College website and in the search bar, um, you can uh, type AP credit equivalencies and it'll give you a whole table of what classes you get credit for for a given AP course. Um, Recently, um, in the past couple of years, that has been um, updated and changed in terms of rules. So students very often do get elective credit of one sort or another for an AP score of three. That did not used to be the case. And then you get credit for very specific courses for AP scores of four or five. Um, the question about do these uh, exempt you from elective courses? Um, yes. So um, all students over the course of the three undergraduate years need to complete 19 elective credits. Um, any credits that you are, that have transferred to the school um, through work done in high school, either through AP or through some college credits earned during high school uh, will uh, cause that credit number that is required to decrease. Um, we have many students that come in with way more than the 19 elective credits. Um, um, already earned. Having said that, it doesn't mean you can't take electives. You come to college to get an education. And um, the broader your education, the better doctor you will be. So it, it really, you know, we'll talk a lot more about that. You, it's not the last time you'll hear me say that. Uh, question, can I defer for a year? Um, because I want to be on campus preferably. Um, you can defer for a year, whether it's because you want to be on campus or you want to defer for a year. Um, students have done that over the years for a variety of reasons. We do not encourage it, obviously, and not very many students do. Uh, but once you've been accepted to the program, you do have the option to request a, a one-year deferral. Um, that was answered. Oh, a question if you're allowed to pursue minors. Um, if so, how and when, and if we don't minor in anything, would that be a problem? You're completing your bachelor's degree in three years. If you have a passion for a specific topic area, yes, you can complete a minor. Um, you need to sort of think about that within the first year in order to be able to complete the appropriate courses. Um, we can give individual advisement about that at the time. We do have a fair number of students who pursue minors, but it absolutely is not a requirement and it absolutely is not going to hurt you if you don't. Um, the most common ones are in psychology um, and sometimes in, in um, ethnic studies of some sort like Latin American studies or black studies, um, sometimes philosophy, um, art, lots of things. But um, a smaller percentage of students complete a minor than, than uh, than those that don't. Um, 
I've heard that Sophie Davis students must take certain courses over breaks, um, winter and summer, and I was just wondering which one. Um, the only actual break where you have coursework that is required is in the summer following your U2 year, and that's the evaluation in healthcare settings course that uh, Dean Auerbach just mentioned. Um, other than that, um, you have the same breaks that you would see in the academic calendar for the college, which you can look up on the, the college website, um, with the exception of following uh, the, the university calendar has something called intercession, which is basically the month of January. Um, as a first year student, you will have that intercession. From then on, you do not have that intercession. We begin classes in early, Jan in early January from the U2 year forward. Um, let's see, that was answered. Campus research opportunities. There are a variety of campus research opportunities. We have a whole office of research within the medical school uh, run by uh, Associate Dean Maria Lima. Um, uh, they have a whole bunch of opportunities listed on their website that you could see. Um, some are on, on campus. We also have uh, send out regularly opportunities that students can apply to for research fellowships elsewhere. Um, the college does have a research partnership with Memorial Sloan Kettering, and many of our students have done research there, also at Mount Sinai, a, a lot of places. That, uh, so there's a lot of time to learn about that, but a lot of students do take advantage of research opportunities both on and, out, on and off campus. Is there a mentoring system for undergraduate students with medical students? There is an, a mentoring system for undergraduate students with upper level undergraduate students. It doesn't mean you will not get to know some of the medical students, but the uh, mentoring system is put together by the uh, Sophie Davis student government. So I suspect you'll hear a lot more about that in the session following this one. Um, that's been answered. The resources available to help with the transition to the medical school portion of the program. There's a lot of those, and I think you've heard about most of them. And, and you know, you'll learn more as as we go. But uh, there is an orientation prior to uh, entering the medical school. But you also will have financial aid seminars, as Ms. Fulton mentioned. Um, uh, you'll have access to the learning center, where you'll have a lot of uh, uh, opportunity to learn about the study skills needed. So um, there are lots of, of resources available for that. Um, can students manage research and coursework at the same time? Yes, we have, you can. That, that goes along with um, one of the things Vanessa said in her talk, which wasn't only about research, but students can have a life and research might be part of that life or maybe community service will be your thing rather than research. But it's all a matter of like everything in life, time management. You need to learn to manage your time in order to be able to do what you want to spend your time outside of your classes doing. Um, do students get to choose classes or are they assigned to classes? Um, it's a little bit of both, but it's mostly assigned. We'll talk about that in June. Um, uh, students do have those 19 elective credits and those are totally up to you. But except for that, the courses that you must take and when you must take them for the most part are pretty assigned by us. Um, it, it is the way one can have an accelerated program in three years by having the entire cohort move through the same courses at the same time. Um, this one is, is important for the small number of out-of-state students. As an out-of-state student, um, what steps can I take to become a New York State resident? And that's actually very important over time. Um, you cannot become a New York State resident uh, immediately. It takes a year of residency within New York State. Um, you can figure out how to do that. Um, there's a, a really good PDF on the City College website. If you type into the um, search bar at the top, New York State Residency, the first thing that comes up in the search will give you the exact steps. It's, it's obvious things like, um, establishing a New York address um, that is continuous for a year, um, a, a New York bank account, registering to vote in New York State. Um, and yes, you can become a New York State resident, even if your parents continue 
to claim you as a dependent on their tax return. So it 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 is doable, but you have to start it very soon after uh, after it, you arrive um, at the college. That one's been answered. Uh, what is the match rate for students going into pediatrics? And is Sophie Davis equipped to help people explore pediatrics? Abundantly, yes. We love students going into pediatrics. Um, and actually, the last two years, I would say our match rate at the pediatrics is 100%. Um, so, uh, but uh, to let you know, just uh, the match rate for just general to residency this year um, is about 96%. So students are getting residencies. Um, do, do, do. What do you recommend students begin doing in terms of extracurricular activities in order to prepare for residency matching? Oh my goodness. Um, I, I love that you're all so proactive already. Um, just be active. The, the things that you do in the undergraduate years, it's not that they don't matter for residency, but the most important thing is to explore things that you love and things that will bring you, you know, some sort of joy. Maybe you like doing community service and, um, or research or any of those things will not hurt your residency. But there's nothing that we're going to recommend other than that you be an active student, both academically and in the activities that you that you choose to engage in. Um, what are the best strategies to study? We're gonna talk about that so much you're gonna get tired. Um, so that will begin a little bit at the orientation in June, but it will be uh, more so talked about, you know, there will be a two day orientation on the 23rd and 24th of August, prior to your beginning classes on the 25th. We'll begin uh, part of that, uh, will be talking about um, how to do uh, learning for the long term. Um, we'll probably do what we did last year, which is use a, a book called Make It Stick. We're, we're now um, sort of planning that. But then you're in, in your first semester of college, you will take a seminar course called New Student Seminar. And a, a huge portion of that class is aimed at how to transition to college, how to study appropriately for college, um, how to manage your time, um, probably three quarters of the class is about what are the best strategies to study. Um, I think the information about how and when to apply for the pre-matriculation program is in your packet. Um, I don't remember if it was, I think it was mentioned briefly from Ms. Patterson uh, that there is not a, a meal plan for students that are living in the, the towers. Um, I can tell you that there are kitchens and students do learn how to feed themselves. And, um, and also I, I know that Ms. Patterson is right about parents dropping off a whole week worth of food every Sunday or something. Um, that's very common. So um, it, there is no meal plan, um, but I think that it, it works out fine. Um, and then it says, since there are no meal plans, are there any places that students can get food on campus? Yes, there is a cafeteria on campus, but you also are in a very vibrant community when you're living on the CCNY campus. And there are wonderful places to get food just off campus. Um, so, and students do all of those things, both their own cooking, their parents cooking, the cafeteria and, and little off campus uh, restaurants. So, um, what facilities can Sophie Davis students use? Are there libraries and study halls open every day? Um, when we are fully live, um, when we're in Harris Hall, our, our students have their own study uh, space uh, in the building um, below the student lounge, which students also use for, for study. Um, the study space below the student lounge is primarily for undergraduate students. Um, we also have a floor within the uh, Cohen Library, which is in, in the building next to our building um, that is reserved for Sophie Davis student study. Um, but there are other spaces within the library for Sophie Davis students to be able sp to study. So when we're fully live, I think if students choose to, to look around for places to study, it's certainly not an issue. Um, I don't know what this question means. Can I have medical fees waived if I have medical insurance? Um, 
90 plus percent of our students are covered uh, for health insurance on their parents' plans. Um, and I don't know of any medical fees that are required for the college. Um, you are required to have health insurance uh, as a medical student, even though we believe everyone should have health insurance everywhere, not just the, the students. But um, uh, as undergraduates, you will not be asked to prove that, but we obviously encourage everyone to have health insurance. But as a medical student, you will need to prove that you have health insurance. It's an absolute requirement. Um, when will you know what materials and books you'll need for next year? We'll talk about that in June at the orientation. Once you are registered, you can find when your schedule appears on CUNY first, uh, you can find information about each class and what you're going to need. Um, what do students need in terms of laptops, books, et cetera? Um, we do not have a specific uh, um, model or brand of laptop that we recommend, um, but we do think that every student should have a laptop. It is something that you absolutely will need. Um, let's see. Oh, how do students from, uh, from CSOM perform on the national board exams? Um, so last year um, for the step one, for those students who took it, our first time pass rate actually is 100% right now um, for first time test takers. Uh, the average score was 230, and uh, just for comparison, the national average score is 234, so it's a little below, but pretty close. Um, for the Step 2 CK score this year, our pass rate was 96%, which given the size of the class means two students did not pass on the first attempt, they passed on the second attempt. Um, nationally, that pass rate is 98%. The average was uh, 239, the national average is 244. So our students are doing well on the uh, nationally standardized uh, board exams. We're trying to get those average numbers up to compare to the national average, but we're, we're getting there. Um, if students fail, how does CSOM support and assist them to pass? Um, there's a coaching program for step one uh, study where there are a group of about 14 faculty and staff who um, work individually with students from the minute they start studying for step one, which is actually in the summer following the M1 year. And those same coaches will continue to work with students if they for some reason don't pass. Um, we very closely monitor that students are ready to take the exam, which is why our pass rate was 100%, because if a student is not ready, they shouldn't be sitting for the exam. Um, there is also a lot of help for that through our Learning Resource Center. Um, a lot of work has gone in recently to uh, figuring out how to help students um, to, uh, to do well in standardized testing. Um, how safe is the CCNY campus? Um, very. I mean, we have a, 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 a public safety department and I think they do a, a, a really good job. It's very rare for there to be crime on campus. Um, and it's even somewhat rare for there to be reported crimes even immediately off campus. I am not going to say that it never occurs. This is New York City. Of course it occurs. Uh, but by and large, um, uh, the campus and the surrounding area uh, are safe, particularly on campus for sure. Um, is it easy to find part-time and summer jobs on campus? Um, not necessarily so easy, but there are several different types. One where it is easy, is if part of your financial aid package uh, um, includes work study, then you can very easily get a work study job on campus. Um, there are other college assistant type jobs on campus, um, uh, not as easy to get because there aren't no, nearly enough of them, but we could talk about that individually. Um, how do I send immunization records to the school? Um, you'll receive information about all of that in June, which I keep saying of, uh, there's a lot of stuff happening in June at the orientation, we'll tell you all about that. But you should be sort of making sure you have your immunization records ready and available. Um, if you um, attended a New York City public high school, I think those records will be transferred automatically, but we will talk about that at registration. Um, and do I recommend a freshman having a job while going to school? Not unless it's absolutely necessary. And um, absolutely necessary is a personal decision on your part, but I do think if you can manage to go to college without needing to work at the same time, um, you will have a much better college experience and have the ability to um, pay attention to your learning in a way that will 
put things into your long-term memory the way that it needs to be. Um, having said that, we do understand that at least during the undergraduate years, many of our students do continue to work part-time. Um, and that's fine if that's what you need to do. And it is doable. It may, may mean giving up um, some other opportunities on campus that you might have been able to do, but there are students that do that. We do not recommend or we strongly discourage, we wish we could forbid um, any students working once you enter the medical school. Um, medical school financial aid is set up in a way that even if it means going into debt, you can take out enough debt, uh, enough loan for both tuition and living expenses. And it is very hard to work uh, during the time that you're in medical school. Um, that also, in my opinion, includes much of the latter part of the undergraduate years. And that's my very long list of questions. If you have something that wasn't answered, um, I'm, you can submit questions uh, later and we'll make sure you get a written answer. Um, hi, Mr. Macbeth. Just one thing, this is a tear from the towers. Sorry, I've been getting a lot of dings in regards to some questions regarding um, room assignments. And so if you don't mind answering it real quickly in regards to if you're allowed to live with SOFI students, um, the towers, we do have um, a SOFI floor for the pandemic. We didn't necessarily have that, um, but we do have a SOFI Davis floor. We have an option for you to do roommate, um, roommate matching. So we have a software called Please Don't Snore. Based on when you sign your agreement, you'll be able to match, each, match yourself through that roommate software. Um, and that process is from June 3rd to July 15th. So if you sign your agreement prior to then, you will have the opportunity to match yourself through that software. So that's all, sorry, I had a lot of questions about that in the chat. So I just wanted to, so let you guys know as well. Great, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, can, I, uh, can I answer some of my questions? This is Kamal from Financial Aid. So some of my questions were if, uh, when the students are expected to receive their financial aid package, most of the students have been uh, packaged already. So if you don't see your financial aid as of right now, so as we discussed, like how you can see your financial aid, you go to your CUNY first account, your financial aid, and then you can see if your financial is not there. Uh, so there might be something on your to-do list, like you're asking for the verification documents, citizenship documents, or you're probably not um, receiving financial aid based on your parents' expected family contribution. Please contact our office. Uh, somebody just posted our Zoom meeting information. Um, so please join our Zoom meeting on Monday so somebody should be able to assist you with that. And some, uh, somebody asked me about, about if their situation has changed because of COVID. Yes, you can apply for the income adjustment. Uh, in order for you to get that information, you can check our website. If not, then you can just call, um, join the Zoom meeting, ask for me, or someone will be able to assist you. If you have any kind of questions regarding financial aid, someone should be able to assist you. So just join the Zoom meeting on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and as you can all see, we're going to attempt to answer all your questions. If we're not able to, uh, there will be information in the chat box about where you can reach me or Ms. Peel to follow up with you with any questions you have. Um, Dr. Meyer is our Executive Director of Admissions, Wellness, and Counseling. She has also a set of questions that she would like to address. Hi, everybody. Um, wow, we've been sitting here for a long time, and I was going to talk to you for about an hour, so I'll cut it down, but I'm only kidding. Um, I, I'm going to address my questions in the, in the content of what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, um, you have been sitting patiently, and I know that wonderful part is when you, the admitted students get to go meet with our students. And I'm gonna to talk to you a, a little bit about uh, wellness and counseling. And with that in mind, I think for all of our um, own mental health, um, I think I would serve you well to make my way quickly through this. Um, but I do wanna thank everybody for sharing your beautiful Saturday with us. Um, I would love, as Clarence said, I'd love to be sharing a meal with you in the faculty dining room, but we'll have plenty of time to do that when we're all back hugging each other in person. Um, and, you know, sitting here today, it just always makes me feel so proud. I, I know that Dean Macbeth feels this way. He and I have been here for more years than you could imagine, and it never gets tired. When we get to this day, it is so exciting to hear our students, to see the newly accepted students. It, it just makes me feel like it's such a wonderful family to be a part of. 
Um, and also before I say anything else, I just wanna give a special thanks to Mr. Irves and Ms. Peel for making all of this happen, um, along with all of the admissions office staff and Mr. Irves acknowledged earlier and Mr. Omer Kabir um, for the Herculean effort that it takes um, for us to get through the admission season and end up here today. Um, and, um, and also to thank our students who spoke and Dr. Io, I, I think for you, for the people who are here to hear about our school and students who are considering coming, or I've even gotten some messages in the chats from people who've been admitted and have already accepted it, that hearing from the students and from Dr. Io has made them feel so excited about coming. And it's true. I mean, you see the kinds of people, you see the students who come, who, who become your dear friends and colleagues, you know, for, for a lifetime. It's, 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 it's incredible. Um, so in my role here, um, one of the things I do is I serve on the admissions committee. So I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of you and I've learned about all of you. And I wanna tell you that you are truly a remarkable group of applicants. You heard from Dean Friedman, how competitive admissions was this year. Um, and we're just so honored to have you and your families here with us today. Um, as the head of wellness and counseling, um, I'll tell you a bit of what we do, because as you know, Wellness is key. I think we all know that, particularly from this past year. Um, but also, if you want to be a doctor, you surely, surely have to be able to take care of yourself if you want to take care of other people. Um, so for wellness, we like to think of it in a holistic way. It's not just like medical, physical wellness. It's, it, it's every part of us. It's our mind, our body, our spiritual life, our social life, our financial life. Um, and um, that's how we, that's how I like to approach wellness. And this year, we particularly tried this year of COVID, um, um, which seems like a blur in many ways. It feels like it went so fast and it went so slow um, that we've been trying to provide, to make wellness more accessible to people wherever they are, meaning that you can have it and do it in your own bedroom if you want to. Um, and this, we provide resources for all of our students, for faculty and staff. And every week I send a wellness message and it includes some kind of a resource that's available to people. Um, certainly things like online classes from cardio classes, Zumba, Pilates, yoga. Uh, we have information weekly about mindfulness, which is something that we all value very much. And you'll learn more about that in the summer premature matriculation program. Um, I provide information about online concerts. Um, last week, I sent information about a young pianist who won a, uh, a contest in high school, and he now has his own quintet. And I gave a link for his concert, which is on I think April 24th. If anyone's interested, you can be in touch with me. But things like dance, music, speakers, art, museums, spiritual resources. Um, and, and, and for example, last week I honored National Poetry Month, which April's National Poetry Month and sent what I thought was a very beautiful poem entitled Kindness um, and some poetry resources. So we try to touch every part of, of people and, and, and I work with something, it, it sort of goes on and on, but I created a wellness toolkit, which gives a list of all the different things that I think go into what we need to keep ourselves well. And I'll relate back to that and provide resources. But you know, all of us can, we don't need anything special. We can all go out for a 20 minute walk. We can, if it's sunny out, we can get some you know, sunshine and some vitamin D and it's free. And so there's no reason, there's not a good excuse for any of us to not be well and stay well really. Um, and when we're back on campus, we continue with all kinds of wellness activities, but of course we do have a gym. That was one of the questions. There is a gym which is in the building, actually right next to our building. They've got machines, weights, classes, personal training. Um, City College offers, um, there are gyms where you can play basketball. They offer intramurals for, I think for soccer and basketball. Often, you know, people from Sophie Davis get together and form their own intramural team or often, our, our students get together and have their own kind of intramurals, often an interclass competition in basketball or soccer, or it could be other things like, doesn't have to be 
sports. It could be trivia or other kinds of games and contests that are fun. Um, there is a pool at City College. It has been out of commission for a long time, and I have been told it is in the process of being refurbished and will be reopening soon, which is exciting for those of you who like to swim. Um, and there's also nearby places like Riverbank State Park. Um, there are farmers markets that I provide information about. So there's a lot, lot of possibility. Um, I've also developed two wellness committees, one for undergrad students, one for medical students, where we meet to talk about the needs of students and how we can better address students' needs in terms of wellness. Um, and currently I'm working with St. Barnabas Hospital. They have a brand new, beautiful fitness facility so that our students are now able to go and um, make use of that fitness facility when, when they're doing their rotations at St. Barnabas. Um, I'll shift gears. So there's a lot that wellness, we think about it a lot. Obviously we're a medical school, it matters. Wellness really matters. Um, in terms of our counseling office, um, we have a, a terrific counseling office. We have, um, I'll just tell you quickly, we have six psychologists and one psychiatrist. We provide free and unlimited counseling service throughout the seven years. Um, this is unheard of in any other medical school or even college. Um, and it is strictly confidential. There are no records kept. It doesn't go on your record. Nobody knows. Um, so it, it, it's a wonderful service that many of our students take advantage of. I also help students. There are other kinds of mental health resources. I will send information about them, but there are things on the City College campus that I will often hook our students up with if they would rather not be seen by someone in our counseling office. By the way, the people in our counseling office are not on the faculty and staff at school. So you actually see them in their own private practice office. So they're not a part, nobody, the other people at school don't know them and have contact with them. But there are other resources on campus that I help students access and it also helps students get counseling by using their own insurance, which some people like to do. But I wanna say that our mental health really matters. And I think we know that. And the school knows that. And it's why they have prioritized the support of our counseling office so that students' mental health can be addressed. It's not uncommon for people to feel stressed or, or, or you know, deal with difficult personal family issues in the course of these next seven years. And um, we try to be as accessible as we can. And we also know that for a lot of students um, in their families, they've been told that it's kind of not acceptable to get help, to get mental health help. And I think that's something that I understand. Um, it's true in so many cultures that we're kind of told, um, keep it at home, don't air your dirty laundry. But a lot of students still come forward and ask for help and have really benefit so that they can be more successful as students and helpful to their own um, patients. So um, I guess I'd say that when and hopefully if you decide to join our Sophie Davis family, for those of you who haven't yet made your decision, um, I think you'll see what a supportive environment this is. I mean, we always refer to us as a family and we really are a family um, in so many ways. And we would love to have you join our family. We've tried to continue our supportive environment throughout COVID um, and certainly we'll continue it going forward. So I look forward to getting to know you and celebrating when you graduate with your BS in 2024. And then when you get your MD in 2028, um, it will be an incredibly exciting time. Um, I did put my email um, in the chat because sometimes I know parents have questions. So if you would like to email me, I should give you Dean McBeth's email too. Um, and we'd be happy to get back to you about that. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. Uh, this concludes our reception for admitted students. But as I mentioned earlier, all students you're asked to stay logged in, zoomed in, and there was give it, uh, let's say, let's take five minutes and then there will be formal discussion with students, current students in the Sophie Davis program. And it's for students only. So again, students, we'd like you to give it five minutes and stay on with us and 
Thank you and congratulations again uh, to all the admitted students and their families. Enjoy this nice spring day. <laughs>